a great pleasure I'm going to be able to describe to you for the first time really in a in a um, international setting uh, a diverse portfolio of dynamic simulation models uh, many of them involving components of AI that we've built uh, to support and successfully enhance COVID-19 decision making at an operational tactical and strategic level um, and uh, this work has been conducted with partners uh, on the health system side uh, from the regional level, provincial, national, and, and internationally. My name is Nathaniel Osgood. Uh, I uh, served for 13 months as the director for our provincial COVID-19 uh, modeling efforts, um, uh, a capacity which I continue in a, in a contractual and advisory capacity. Uh, I also serve as the Chief Research Advisor for our Saskatchewan Center for Patient-Oriented Research, the, uh, the co-lead of a, of a national-level effort uh, for uh, education on AI and public health, and particularly for understanding its equity implications, uh, and uh, direct a variety of international uh, training and education events related to this intersection of computational methods, including AI and, and public health. Um, so uh, this work was conducted through the major efforts of, of those um, within our laboratory um, through collaborations with these uh, various levels of health system partnerships. And I want to particularly single out uh, a few of the individuals in the slides for, for truly heroic uh, contributions, both in terms of ours worked, but also um, uh, detours from their thesis work to undertake uh, the, the uh, remarkable efforts that gave rise to uh, a very powerful set of assets um, being used in day-to-day -day decision making and in uh, planning uh, throughout, throughout the world. Uh, the work began with uh, partnerships uh, predominantly at the health level with our Ministry of Health and, and Health Authority to help them manage day-to-day -day decision making and, and uh, planning. Uh, operationally, tactically, and strategically with respect to COVID-19, but quickly expanded to support um, uh, groups uh, within our federal government, particularly the Public Health Agency of Canada, for which we, uh, we provide day-to-day uh, -day, uh, monitoring for each province of Canada, as well as for the First Nations and Inuit Health Branch of, uh, of Health Canada, which provides Indigenous health services for First Nations reserves across the country, also supported by our modeling efforts. Uh, finally, the work has informed decision making in uh, territories and provinces around Canada and internationally uh, within Australia. Um, what you're going to see uh, described within the course of this presentation um, addresses a variety of, of needs brought to us uh, by our health partners um, uh, nationally and internationally. Uh, that came in a variety of forms. These needs um, identified uh, uh, a set of uh, challenges uh, involving uh, particular uh, specific um, needs that, that were, uh, ended up being captured in different models. Um, some of those needs related to understanding the trade-off between different types of interventions, public health orders, for example. Others yet um, to, to help plan around different levels of capacity utilization, whether for ICUs, hospitals, or uh, public health service demands. Um, yet others related to projection needs, understanding where things might be going over the short and long term, and particularly the risk of overrunning certain thresholds, uh, such as those associated with, with resources like uh, ICU or hospital beds. Um, now, just as uh, different needs might motivate you to make use of different maps, for example, if you're in an unfamiliar city, the need to drive across the city would lead to your, your use of a very different map than if you, if you require transit, um, uh, transit uh, travel across that city. Uh, so it is we build different sorts of models to address different questions. And uh, in the course of this work, uh, we built uh, approximately uh, five or six different um, modeling types to address the questions we saw in this previous slide. Um, because of limited time, I'm going to concentrate on two primary one, uh, two primary types of models uh, that are distinguished uh, at once in terms of their uh, their impact, their versatility, 
uh, the scope of contribution and the tenure uh, of their use uh, within these organizations. The first of those is an individual model uh, that focuses on a geographically situated uh, characterization of our province. Um, each community, large or small, um, characterized together with its demographics and with uh, each individual within those communities um, from a synthetic population, not, not corresponding to a, a very particular person, but uh, a person with, with similar characteristics um, uh, existing in the model. Uh, like many more detailed models out there, um, uh, we characterize things like workplaces, households, and schools. But what distinguished this model um, was also its, its attention to many vulnerable populations, uh, to elderly residents in long-term care, to uh, individuals in the uh, religiously inspired intentional communities of colonies that are scattered throughout our, our nation's uh, uh, prairie provinces. Uh, those individuals uh, encountering challenges in shelter in terms of uh, uh, needing uh, homeless, uh, homeless shelters um, uh, for, for Saskatchewan's uh, challenging winters. Uh, we also represented acute care facilities uh, as well as um, things like facilities associated with cohort, cohorting of patients who are infected so they don't have to remain at home in, in crowded homes. Um, beyond this, we characterized a variety of processes um, taking place within these communities, whether it's things like screening um, at a door-to-door -door level, uh, contact tracing, lab processes um, that led to delays in reporting, and, and other, um, other public health-related processes. Uh, all of these were represented um, partly to, uh, in, in reflection of the fact that there are venues for transmission, but in large part also because many of them, whether it's long-term care or, or acute care facilities uh, or homeless shelters, are points of very specific intervention. With long-term care, for example, um, we can uh, intervene in ways that are characteristic of that environment, restricting visitors or, or prohibiting staff sharing or engaging in cohorting of, of staff within the facilities or uh, regular screening. Um, and we have different measures yet involving PPE use and, and other factors within acute care facilities. Models at this level, which are sometimes classified as AI methods, though I, I would beg to differ with that, um, are uh, further characterized mixing of individuals and in gatherings, uh, large and small in communities and homes, um, uh, inter-community mixing, different variants as we see them resurgent in Canada today, uh, vaccinations of various sorts, in particular, the impacts of particular public health orders, both at a regional and, and provincial level. Um, these models are, are thinking tools, far from being crystal balls that tell us the correct understanding of, of what's likely coming up. Uh, they serve as tools predominantly to help us more quickly identify uh, incorrect thinking on our part, uh, cases where our cherished preconceptions or, or judgments are off base and at variance with evidence uh, or with, uh, with uh, clinical and epidemiological understanding. Um, the models are articulated, as with almost all of our models, um, in a uh, highly visual fashion, uh, in a way that welcomes critique from those uh, from diverse backgrounds, and particularly those uh, out who, whose background does not include modeling, uh, in a commitment that, that stretches across uh, projects going back decades from our lab. So models like this can help us understand many features of the situation, understanding where infections are still taking place in the context of different public health orders uh, and the layered impact of different interventions uh, undertaken uh, successively or in combination and in, in intervention portfolios within public health orders as they have impacted um, cases and underlying infections uh, within communities or more broadly in regions or across the province. Um, and a great deal of our province's early decision making and ongoing decision making has been informed and guided by understanding of these trade-offs uh, emerging uh, from these, uh, these individual level geographically specific models. Um, conscious of time, I, I want to move on though to a, a second sort of model that um, is undeniably uh, rooted in artificial intelligence machine learning and has that as a central part of its formulation. 
Uh, these are models that are uh, continuously refreshed with data, much as we, we trust weather models much, much more fully um, for their predictions, say, for tomorrow. If they've been refreshed by data every few hours um, in recent days, than we would a model prediction for tomorrow's weather from, from two weeks ago. Uh, these models uh, are like weather models and they're being constantly encountered by, challenged by, and learning from using artificial intelligence and machine learning methods that are Bayesian in character, uh, a variety of, of data sources. Uh, these data sources include more traditional ones, such as cases and testing levels and deaths and ICU and hospital admissions and census. But they also include uh, a variety of novel data sources. Um, uh, most prominently in our work here, uh, wastewater data, um, where it is available in municipalities, but also including in other contexts, social media data, data from smartphones, uh, data from search patterns online. This data is brought together with uh, theory capturing dynamic models, capturing the, the natural history and, and transmission characteristics of COVID-19 together with AI and machine learning approaches that put them together, the, all these components together to estimate the current situation and allow us to project forward. So far from being curve fitting models, um, uh, these models uh, ask what's going on in the underlying situation and seek to, to really adequately and, and very with high fidelity match up uh, the many data sources we see, but as different reflections of an, of an underlying situation that is uh, in a large majority unobservable. Um, we use AI inference to combine these observations, um, but in ways that square with theory as best we understand it from the, the clinical and epidemiological literature. And specifically, we use machine learning that's Bayesian in character uh, together with dynamic models to, to identify really a salient understanding um, that's consistent with our understanding of how COVID-19 develops from clinical studies, et cetera, that best accounts for what, what we're observing. And these models are kept constantly refreshed with data and can then be used to project forward and ask what if questions that are counterfactual in nature. The result of this is, is a little bit like population tomography. Um, you heard just in the last uh, slide some of the trade-offs associated with uh, computed tomography machines. Uh, these machines are, are distinguished not so much by the quality of any one image, but the fact that diverse images, each with terrible omissions and, and, and uh, uh, simplifications, uh, limited field of view, uh, blurring, uh, shadows cast, etc., can be knit together into a consistent picture of the underlying situation. And so it is with our models. Uh, we expect these models to account for all the observed patterns of, of empirical data shown here with the, uh, the small squares uh, using the model distribution for, for what's expected um, for both traditional and novel data sources such as wastewater. Um, but we further expect it to give a, we, we elicit from it an understanding of things that we can't directly observe, things like the number of undiagnosed infectives, the effective reproductive number, or the risk borne by individuals as they circulate in their own community in the so-called uh, force of infection. And this gives us now this opportunity to ask what if questions going forward and um, to anticipate where things might be going and things such as the ICU utilization within our province in ways that are informed uh, by, by uh, new and, and uh, traditional data sources as well as uh, by structured understanding of, of COVID-19's progression. So diverse types of hybrid models can offer really great value in, in planning for, preventing, and controlling uh, COVID-19 everywhere from the operational level up to the strategic level, locally to internationally. The models are built for different purposes and agent-based and hybrid methods do provide texture characterization of trade-offs between deep, uh, detailed intervention types, whereas Bayesian AI machine learning algorithms uh, provide models with always updated views that are synergistic with large-scale data collection. And models of this sort offer much greater strength yet if they're used together with scalable architectures and day-to-day -day reporting such as we've built to support uh, the, the initiative here. And finally, these approaches offer a really strong asset for our province going forward, which it's leveraged more and more with uh, 
some of the highest level decision makers in our province singling out the models as the number one asset that they had for this pandemic to confront the challenges of COVID-19. And they put us in good stead to confront uh, further health challenges over the coming years. I'd like to close by offering my sincere thanks to all the students who made this incredible work possible, to our funders, uh, both at a provincial, uh, national, and international level, uh, and to those who have helped inspire the work. Thank you very much.